Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got two guests. First, I've got Ms. Bahak, the host of the Airborne Mind podcast, amongst other things. And second, I've got Dr. Megan Caden, who is a clinical psychologist. Together, they've created a course called The Art of Connection. And on this show, we go into a lot of different things. If you've been listening to me for any amount of time, you'll know how much I love psychology. So the the opportunity to talk to a psychologist as well as Mizba, who knows a ton about the topic, um, I, I just took the liberty of going in a lot of different directions. And we spend a lot of time talking about relationships with intimate partners, with friends, with uh, clients, with people that we're teaching. And in detail, we talk about the importance of in, in, a, in an intimate relationship, especially the importance of nurturing both the, the individuality of each person as well as the relationship as a unique entity, as like a third entity. Uh, we talk about blaming others versus taking accountability, how to fight properly and good conflict resolution. We talk about the dance between connection slash intimacy and sex and desire and how they are, they, they require almost opposing things in our life and how to, um, how to do that dance successfully. We talk about how to pick a therapist when there are so many options and, and frankly, so many bad therapists out there. So uh, we talk about things to look for there. And then drawing on their course on connection, we talk about what motivates people to change and how to use that knowledge to be a better coach, teacher, educator of any sort. And finally, we talk about a tactical approach to getting people to buy into a program or an idea using the what they call the empathic approach outlined in their course on connection. I've taken their course. It's phenomenal. And I just took this the, the time on this show to dive in even deeper into the topics that they discuss. Before we get started, if you're a new listener of the show and you haven't done so already, check out the website, go to brutestrengthtraining.com and sign up for the newsletter. That's where we're going to keep you up to date on all of the podcasts, videos that we put out, as well as any other free content that we're putting out. If you're a regular listener and haven't done so already, head to iTunes, hit the subscribe button, leave me a rating. If you love it, let me know. If you hate it, let me know that too. Hope you enjoy the show. All right. What's up, guys? Um... I'm super excited for this podcast. Thank you for making some time for it. I'm always excited, but there are a few topics that I'm most fired up about and relationships and psychology is like at the, at the very, very top of it. So both of you have like unique skill sets and knowledge about both of those topics. And I'm just excited to see kind of where this conversation goes. Thanks for having us. I'm Absolutely. so excited we're here. Yeah, I'm honored. I mean, you know, relationships and communication overall is like a topic I've nerded out on ever since I was young. And when I met Meg and we could go back and forth on this, it was super, uh, it, it gave me a lot of energy. And so to have you on here and interested in this as well is, uh, it has, a, it adds a whole nother element to this. Oh yeah. So you guys created a course called the art and science of connection. So very briefly, where did the inspiration for this come from? Was it a conversation? Where did it all start? Let's see. So it started because, so Mizba is coaching at Revival Strength, as you know, and um, I am a psychologist in private practice, but I also work with the coaches at Revival Strength on relationship building and working on their relationships with their clients. Um, and, you know, and we've had many conversations over the past number of months about, you um, about connection and about how excited we both are about talking about that. And we have such different 
but uh, supporting skill sets in terms of, you know, Ms. is really awesome at social media and marketing and all of the sort of back end stuff and the tech stuff and the recording and all of that that I know nothing about. Um, so it just kind of organically came together that we, we both separately were thinking of creating a course like this. And we were like, oh, you're you're doing that. Oh, you're doing that. Let's just do it together. So it was pretty organic. That's awesome. Yeah. It was also um, when we look at the skill sets that we each bring to the table, you know, from practicing therapy on Meg's end and the skill, the micro skills that you need to have to be able to conduct that um, successfully. And then also podcasting and coaching and the little micro skills that come with that, as you may know as well. When we kind of combine those two things together, it was absolutely fascinating how much I learned from Meg that was so basic to her. And then Similarly, how much kind of I think she learned uh, from me when I was thinking about like something I learned from Larry King, you know, that was a, a basics on asking good questions and the way I, ta- I thought about uh, stories and having conversations. So kind of uh, indulging in each other's skill sets that way um, just brought something new to the table that we knew for sure that there should be a little more dialogue about. Ms. has a knack for knowing what what is actually going to be interesting and challenging for people. And I think I was really stuck in this like, oh, it's it's either too t- too complicated. What, and I don't, I don't have a way of explaining this to coaches in a way that they're going to be able to actually make use of. Um, and he could sort of kind of look at some content that I had created or just some random idea I'd had and be like, that is awesome. That, that's something we could sell. Nice. And I, I just would never even cross my mind that that was like a, a sellable product. Right. Well, this concept in the functional fitness community, especially about this, this, there's this growing concept that we're, we're actually in the relationship business, right? Um, it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not all about sets and reps and just getting a great workout in. It's about inspiring members. It's about making a connection with them so that they buy into the program so that they can get permanent long-term results. And I think it's cool that you guys are building out something. You've already built out something and are, and are working on others as well that are actually teaching people how to run a better business in the relationship business. It's really cool. So Great. I can't wait to hear your feedback about the course and what your experience was taking it. We will dive into it. I, I okay. really loved it. And it, it, yeah, it really resonated with me in, in some intuitive ways and ways that I feel like I, I operate naturally at this point in my life, but then also, um, your, the third step in that empathic approach was like a really big light bulb for me. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Before we get into the course that you guys put together, I just want to take a I want to take the first half of this and just go through some really big topics in relationships while I have both of you on the same show with me. Yeah. So the first one that I want to talk about is the importance in any relationship of nurturing both the individual and the couple, the couple as an entity. And the way that I first discovered this concept, uh, Adi and I were meeting with, uh, I don't know if I would call her a therapist, but it was like a relationship coach that we still meet with. And I'm naturally super independent from, from as early as I, as early as I can remember, I just wanted to do my own thing at all times, right? A D is the complete opposite. She wants to do everything with me at all times, right? So we're on polar opposite ends of the spectrum. And when we first met, we're absolutely obsessed with each other. Neither one of us wanted to spend a single minute away from each other, right? Over a year or so, this started to fade a little bit, right? Where I wanted some of my independence again. And so there was, that was like a new challenge for us. And our coach taught us that we both have to nurture our individual, like the the individual, like I have to nurture myself. She also has to nurture herself. But then I all, I had to learn to nurture the, the, the entity, the relationship. So can you guys speak a little bit to that in terms of a, Like, why is that important from a psychological standpoint, as well as like from your own experience? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Um, there's so many things that you said that I, I'm really interested in and excited about, both on a personal level and also working with the couples that I work with. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that we we choose partners who are this is sort of just an unconscious intuitive way that humans work we choose partners who have a quality or a trait or a characteristic or a need that is going to bring out something that we haven't developed yet so a part of ourselves that we either know that we want to grow or expand or a part of ourselves that we don't even know exists that needs nurturing so there's this, um, I think he was actually a sex therapist named David Snarch or Schnarch, Snarch. And he talks about relationships as people growing machines. So it's this idea that the relationship itself is this system that is set up to challenge us to grow in ways that we wouldn't grow if we weren't in that relationship. So that's what that makes me think of that you, you needed whether you knew it or not, but that for you to be a fully expressed, fully um, balanced, fulfilled person, you needed to grow in the more cooperative, collaborative parts of you. And Adi probably needed to grow in the more individualistic, focusing on herself, doing things on her own part of herself, whether she knew that or not. You're spot on. And, and, and for, yeah, just to be very transparent, like for me, that that individuality has shown up as like being selfish, right? Like not contributing to teams I've been a part of or, um, or, or friends or family members at times and just being very selfish with my time and resources, right? And so yeah. I've, I've, I have, I, I've, I've had to learn to contribute and, and like put my, put my needs aside for the better of the group or for the better of my relationship. And Adi mm -hmm. really struggled with like doing things on her own, right? And she yeah. and she wanted to kind of blossom and like spread sp spread those wings, if you will, and kind of do her own thing. She's she's into dance now. She's making uh, a lot of friends that have nothing to do with me, and mm -hmm. I just see this spark in her eye now. Mm -hmm. You know, like this huge yeah. new uh, piece of her life that wasn't that wasn't existent. So we both brought that to each other. I think that's spot on. I would also guess that you setting your individualistic needs aside for the, for the success of the relationship was also for the success of, of your own individual self. Yes. Is that, oh, do you without, relate to that? Without a doubt. And that's another, that's another knowledge bomb Annie dropped on us. She said like, you put, it's not a, it's not like a selfless thing to put the us before the I, right? By nurturing the us, the I gets nurtured 10 times more than we can even imagine. And I know we're yeah. getting kind of, kind of abstract here, but putting the, putting the, the needs of our relationship first and, and making that like treating the health of our relationships first and most importantly can only benefit our, our own personal health. That's, that's this belief that I'm starting to grow for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're in the right relationship. Right. Cause in the wrong relationship, this can go down a very different path. Right. Yeah. So next what, so blaming others versus taking appropriate accountability. I think most people spend their entire lives treating conflicts where they're trying to attribute blame to the like attribute blame either to their self or to others and they're trying to figure out like what percentage of this am i accountable for miss what is what what's your relationship with taking accountability in your relationship as well as like what you've observed in others like what do you see works and what doesn't well, there's, uh, this is something that, um, when I think about over the last several years, uh, the first word that comes to mind for me is integrity, you know, and I know that's something, uh, you and I have talked about in, in our episodes as well, where constantly shifting blame onto others, um, it, it's the easy way out, right? It's, it's a way for you to kind of, um, turn away the hard work of 
digging inside yourself and kind of confronting the things that you might be uncomfortable with, you know, and, and sitting with that a little bit. Um, and there was a seminar that I went to a couple years back that really was the game changer for me and, and shifted my focus to just blaming, uh, blaming parents, blaming, you know, friends, blaming, uh, employers or the world for things that I was not seeing, um, you know, the way that I wanted to see success in my life, both in relationships and professionally, and really turning that focus inward and being like, whoa, there, there's a huge gap here, uh, with integrity. Like I am not doing the things that, um, I'm promising myself that I want to do. And, uh, I can't remember who gave this example, but you know, integrity to me is like uh, a wheel, right? You think about a wheel and you think about the spokes on that wheel. And every time you don't do something that you say you're going to do, it's like one of those spokes kind of falls off and you don't notice it in the moment, but over time that really adds up and it starts to eat at you inside a little bit. It affects your performance day to day. It affects how you are relating with people. And so I'd say over the last several years, it's become um, a more ingrained thing in me to look inside myself, maybe sometimes even too much where I, I'm not acknowledging that, oh, um, you know, yes, this other this person on the other end also had something to do with it. I'm usually trying to uh, focus entirely on, okay, what is within my control and what what is it that I can work on within myself uh, versus just taking the easy way out and blaming others. And that usually consists of asking some hard questions and really sitting with some of those uncomfortable feelings. Right. Yeah, it feels, like the, it feels like the easy way out in the moment, right? But in my experience, it almost always extends that conflict. Right? I, I can almost never resolve a conflict if I don't take accountability for my part, if I don't make the other person feel like they are sane, right? that they actually have some uh, merit to, to what they're blaming me for. Right? Mm -hmm. what, what's the, what do you think is the impact of always blaming others, Megan? What, like what, what, why is it that when I take accountability to a D, conflict dissolves, but when I blame her, we just can't move forward. Mm -hmm. This is something that we, I think we talked about this in our course, or maybe it was on the podcast, on Ms's podcast. Um, there's a, there's a switch in the brain that gets flipped when someone feels like they have been seen and heard and understood. And I know I physically feel there's like a hook in my brain or like a bookmark or something like a little catch in my brain that I physically feel. I don't even know if that's how it works in the brain, but I feel something until, until I feel like an emotion, usually a strong one has been heard and understood. I can't really get rid of that feeling of this thing being caught in my, in my brain. And I, I think that's a real, it's a real thing for a lot of people. If we feel like our, a strong emotion is, um, being skirted or being denied or being put back on us, um, it, our, our nervous system doesn't want us to let go of it. And I think that it's a primal survival drive in us that we need, that feeling is telling us something's wrong. Something needs attention. Something needs attention. Something needs attention. And until it gets the attention it's looking for, it's not going to resolve. We have to feel acknowledged, right? Yeah. Even if, yeah. even if I am 90% responsible for a, a situation, I still want to feel acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't yeah. resolve until until that happens. Yeah. One uh, one like th just monumental thing that we learned is this, is a um, a concept of the first person that brings like like that takes accountability and brings both of us back to center and back to like connection is called the hero, and mm -hmm. we've started to look at it almost like a competition, like who can be who can be the bigger person right now and take accountability first? Because that takes, that takes real vulnerability. It takes courage because at certain times, if a D takes accountability first and I'm not ready, I might, I might totally shut her down, right? And she yeah. knows that, that there is a risk for that. And so it, mm -hmm. it, it really is a heroic act to take accountability first. But when we, when we realize that that's the case, our conflicts last a tenth of the time. It's really remarkable. 
I love that reframe. That's something I might have to use with my clients because it just really shifts that whole mentality. I think so many couples can get into kind of a standoff where no one wants to take the first step because of how scary that is. But to have this this sort of uh, agreed upon competition, like we're both going to try to go for that first is such a useful reframe. I love that. We were lying in bed probably two nights ago and we were, I I don't even remember what the issue was, but we're both lying in bed and we're about to go to sleep, but I know that I'm going to be up for an hour because I, I can't sleep if we're fighting, right? And it's the worst. She, she just, she whispers like five minutes later, I'm sorry. And I immediately, it's done. I'm sorry. And then we're, we're you know, two minutes later, we both took full accountability for our parts. We're hugging and, and cuddling. And then we slept the night away. You know, it's like that. Simple. Wow. So get that story the just like. guys. That story just like made me start to cry a little bit. (laughs) I just know that experience so clearly. It's just, it's such a painful moment. Like what's going to happen? Am I going to be up all night? How are we going to resolve this? How are we going to reconnect? It's really hard. Yeah. So I, I took a class in college called the psychology of love. And one of the, one of the studies that really spoke to me the most was I, I, well, I can't even remember the exact study, but what they showed is that a successful relationship is not one in which there is no fighting. A successful relationship is actually one with good conflict resolution because every single relationship in the world has conflict. It's how you fight. It's how you resolve conflict that really matters. So I would love to hear from both of you, like, what is your strategy for overcoming conflict and what is the, what's kind of the recipe for good conflict resolution? Go ahead. Um, You know, this is something that I've struggled with for a long time and by no means have I, you know, mastered this skill, but I think it comes back to some of what we were just talking about was, uh, you know, being explicit, you know, that's something we cover in the course is like having explicit conversations when you feel like something is off in a relationship, whether that is with your partner, whether that's with a coworker, your boss, um, instead of letting it sit in the background for an extended period of time, you, you know, how fast can you be explicit about it? How fast can you name it and take action on that? That is what I found to be uh, the most fulfilling personally. It's like when I do that, it feels like, you know, a hundred pounds has been lifted off my shoulders when I ignore it. And I just kind of let it sit in my own head and just kind of sit with that feeling. A week goes by two weeks go by. Finally, maybe in the third week, I decide to bring it up. It's like, I may not pick up on it right away, but it was definitely affecting my, um, the way that I function and perform on a day to day basis, the way that I relate to others because I didn't address that. And I think I'm more uh, attuned to that now than I have been in the past, maybe because we're, you know, studying and talking about this stuff a little bit more, but really that's been my focal point is, uh, can I be more explicit? You know, can I, um, you know, name not only how I'm feeling, not try to sugarcoat it at times. And then also, can I, um, you know, can I be that first person uh, to call out when there is a conflict present that we're not kind of bringing to the forefront? Right. I, I, I've heard, I heard this phrase on the podcast that y'all did together and then somewhere else that I can't remember, I think another podcast, make the implicit explicit, right? There are all mm. these things these tensions and like underlying currents that, that are always going on that both, both people know are going on, right? They're not like, we can't hide our body language doesn't lie and we can't hide these things. So the faster, exactly like you're saying, the faster we can make it explicit, we can start to work through it. But what is it? Why do people, yeah. Why do people not speak? Right. Why, Why do they not share? fear. I think fear is the first thing that comes to mind is it's very easy to quickly get caught up in what might happen. You know, what's going to happen if I uh, take this risk of, you know, sharing what's going on? What if I'm wrong? Um, There's so much fear uh, for me, at least that comes up. And, and a lot of times that, you know, that fear may, um, you know, overshadow the courage in that moment. And then you take a step back and you're like, ah, well, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to bring it up. But a lot of times when you do kind of, um, act in the face of that fear, you will find that 
on the other side, it's not, uh, it's not as crushing as you thought it was. And you come out feeling, uh, feeling lighter, feeling better, feeling more fulfilled, feeling like you actually grew as a person because, uh, you acted in the face of fear, right? There's something to be said about that. I mean, a lot of times training, why do we train, right? It's like, we come out on the other side of that workout feeling like we accomplished something. Um, I feel kind of the same way when I can, when I can do that. Um, and, and when I don't usually for me, it's, it's, I'm scared. Right. Without a doubt. Yeah. My biggest one is like, I'm afraid of looking bad. Right. If I'm, if I'm like, if I want to bring up something and like stand up for myself, I'm afraid that I'm like missing something and I'm actually being selfish. Right. And, and mm-hmm. it's going to come out and a D is going to think I'm an asshole and I'm going to look bad. Doc, what does conflict resolution look like for you? What, what are, how are you doing it that's successful? Yeah, I, this has been a big topic between Marcus and me recently because we just, in the past, I would say, month, started using this new technique. So, And I'll, I'll explain what it is. It's been really effective for us. But first, I wanted to describe a little bit of... I wanted to go back to what you said about how normal it is to have conflict in relationships. And one of the ways that we have started to think about our conflict is, um, and this is something our therapist has helped us with, all relationships consist of one third connection, one third disconnection, and then one third repair. Mm -hmm. And that that's a normal, healthy relationship. And so it's really helped me to kind of think differently about um, the disconnection part, because, you know, the connection is the easy part. The disconnection is kind of easy because it happens naturally and happens all the time. It's the repair that is the hard part and that is teachable and learnable. Um, So this is the repair that Marcus and I have been using lately that's been fun and kind of funny sometimes and really useful. So something will happen where there's like some blip between us or like a sticky exchange or tension or something. And the first person to sense it and notice it and kind of come to their senses about, Oh, we got to do something here says something like, okay, so there's this mess in front of us right here. (laughs) And here's my part. And you kind of, so by, by visually sort of pointing out, okay, there's this mess between us right here, depersonalizes it a little bit. So like it sort of takes that element of blame out of it. Like this conversation is not about blaming and it's not even about saying, you know, this is all my mess either. It's saying, okay, there's this mess. We both have a part in it. And then visually pointing, okay, that's my part. I did that. This, you know, I knew I could have done that better. And then, yeah, that part over there is mine too. And then it's a Jedi move there. <laughs> it's Jedi. good, right? It takes a, quite a bit of mindfulness, right? Which, which part to, are you thinking? Well, to be able to detach from your emotions in the middle of conflict and say, oh, I'm feeling fear. Here's how I acted, right? It takes, yeah. it takes uh, some, some awareness, a level of awareness of yourself rather than being just c- completely uh, caught up in your emotions. Yes, absolutely. It definitely requires a pause. Right. Right. So, so, and whoever, whoever has the consciousness to take the pause first is the, is the one to say, okay, wait a second, let's pause here. We made this mess. Yeah. How are we going to clean it up? Like it's, it's ours to clean up. It's right. not mine to clean up or yours to clean up. It's ours. I love that. Enjoying this episode? Hit subscribe. We have more amazing content for you every single week. The next Brute Strength Athlete Camp is on April 14th and 15th in Miami, Florida. These camps are for athletes and coaches that want to learn about mindset, endurance, gymnastics, weightlifting, and general physical preparedness. It's also for athletes of all skill levels. So whether you're still working on your first pull-up or you can do 20 muscle-ups in a row, this camp is for you. The, The feedback that we've gotten on these camps is really overwhelming. People are having huge breakthroughs in their physical performance. But the feedback that we're getting more than anything else is on what people are learning in terms of mindset. We really drill concepts and tactical practices that you can implement into your training and your life that are going to help you build a stronger mind. The flow of the day goes like this. It's lecture, breakout group, lecture, breakout group over and over and over so that you're not doing any one thing for too long. 
and we break people out into small groups so that everyone gets as much individual attention as possible. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash athlete hyphen retreat. That's brutestrengthtraining.com backslash athlete hyphen retreat. Hope to see you there. This episode is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is an online meat subscription service that sends you some of the best meat on the planet right to your doorstep. I made a decision this year to start choosing quality over quantity, and that, that's in terms of movement, in terms of relationships, and in terms of food. I know that I'm gonna eat meat every single day, so I made the decision to start using ButcherBox myself because they send you the highest quality meat you can possibly find. It's all 100% grass raised and finished meat. They're pasture raised animals as well as antibiotic free. Here are some of the benefits that you get from eating grass fed meat. So first off, it has higher levels of vitamins. There's more protein per ounce than in conventional meat. And some of the biggest ones are that it reduces cellular inflammation and improves brain function, and then it helps you get nutrients into your cells better. It also increases something called CLA. In increased CLA is going to improve your metabolism, making it easier for you to burn fat, improve your blood sugar levels. It helps you to fight cancer and reduces your risk of heart disease. The biggest reason that I got it is because it's some of the tastiest meat I've ever had, and I know that it's going to keep me healthier for longer. If you're interested, you can head to butcherbox.com backslash brute for a free package of bacon plus $20 off of your first order. So diving deeper into the, the, the three things that you just talked about. So there's connection, disconnection, and repair. I think what I'm about to say is connected, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So I want to talk about the, the kind of dance between intimacy and connection versus sex and desire. So I heard this stat somewhere recently that we're actually like based on uh, self reports, people are actually like couples are actually more in love than ever, but their sex is worse than ever. And that's why the divorce rate is higher than it's ever been. So in your, in your clinical experience, how does that resonate? The part that I'm stuck on is what does being more in love mean? How are people measuring that? Um, that part confuses me a little bit. And I guess I would have questions about how the, how the questions were asked, how they were getting at that particular variable. Um, but the part about, about lack of sex leading to more divorce. Yes. Agree, 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 agree. So can you talk about the dynamic that both of those require? Like what, what, what kind of things does connection and love require? And then what kind of things does sex and desire require? So this is like the ultimate challenge of relationships is this goes back to what you were saying earlier. How do I be with me and also be with you? And I feel like both love and connection and sex and desire require a balance of both of those that are different. Like we spend so much time and energy in our relationships trying to find a balance between being me and then being us. And because that balance I think is different when we're sort of going through daily life and trying to maintain a connection. And then when we're trying to like want to have sex with each other and, and keep our sex drive alive, they're different. And I think there's a lot more, um, mystery and danger and aggression and anger that is part of sex drive that often gets lost when love and connection is doing really well yeah. and then vice versa Using forces right yes yes they are and uh there's a there's this book called uh, mating in captivity yeah. you may have yeah. you, that's the book i was quoting actually okay that's, that's what i thought thing from there yeah yeah um I feel like she she has such a um, Esther Perel has such a, um, 
uh, useful way of talking about that, that like couples can kind of couples and individuals separate, separate from the couple itself n need to kind of practice the, the art of fluidly moving from one to the other. And that can take a lifetime. I mean, that's that takes work and it takes intention and it takes um, both people really wanting that. But I think I think it is possible. But there, I think there are lots of ebbs and flows for couples where you know sometimes you you overshoot and sometimes you undershoot and you can miss the mark. But it's it's kind of about the uh, intention and the drive to to find that balance. It's not like you hit that balance and you're there. It's like you find it and you lose it and you find it and you lose it and you find it and you lose it. And that's just part of life. Yeah. That's, that's why I called it a dance in the beginning, right? It's like, it, it's never, it's never completely imbalanced. And if it is, it's not for long, right? It, it takes constant yeah. engagement and it's not one of those things that you can just put on the planner and stick to because <laughs> sex and desire, uh, you know, spontaneity, it plays a big role in sex and desire. Um, so it's just not something you can plug in into a system and follow and expect to work for, for a long period of time. That's true. And I would argue that for a lot of couples, putting scheduled sex on the calendar increases the spontaneous sex. So those, okay. yeah, those can go hand in hand. And I think that, you know, every couple kind of has to figure out what the frequency yeah. of scheduled sex has to be to increase the spontaneous sex. But, um, I do think there's a, there's a correlation there. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll chew on that one. Another, an, an interesting thing that I've <clears throat> learned recently, probably through Esther Perel is the fact that the longer you're in a relationship, the more sex becomes kind of like a business transaction, right? And how that can kill the sexual desire, the, the eroticism in the act of sex. So when, we're, when we first get with someone, when we're like courting them and we're first like becoming sexual, there's just so, so much that goes into that one event, right? We're, we're texting for days, we're like, planning this special night there's all of this tension building like both parties are doing everything that they can to flirt and to play and it just it culminates in this really amazing erotic event right <laughs> the longer we get to know someone it's like meet you in the bedroom take off the clothes we're gonna do this or what right uh -huh. <laughs> so a, a really cool thing for me was to realize that you know, I can schedule and I can, I can, be, I can schedule sex with a D, but it's not, it's not just like sex isn't just about sex. It's about so much more, like so many moments outside of just sex. It's in, uh, it's in, you know, going above and beyond to create like a, a date that she will love and to make her feel special and to flirt with her throughout the day. And so I've learned to basically block off like a lot of time to, to, be intimate with her and to l allow that tension to kind of build up, to flirt and allow that tension to build up. Mm -hmm. That's been super helpful. My guess, I just have a theory about that. I feel like that works for a lot of, a lot of couples and there's usually, there's usually one person who falls into the role of creating the vibe and the energy and kind of the build up throughout the day. And then there's the other person who sort of is the recipient of that and needs that build up from the other person and that, that um, focus from the other person to actually feel it. Um, my theory about this is that in the beginning of a relationship, when we're just starting to, you know, there's like all those excited feelings and everything is new. Those are, those are brand new neural pathways that are getting burned in for the very first time. And that's like exciting for us, neurobiologically exciting. Um, and then over time, you know, we, we kind of know what works, we know what the other person likes, and we kind of just use the same, the same methods. And that neural pathway gets super burned in, which is that business transaction that you're talking about. And my theory is that when you're having a whole day of interactions and texts and flirting and, and surprise around what are we going to do tonight? And what's the date he's planning and all of that, there's more room for novelty to be built in, like there's more room for her to be surprised and to have a, a new neural pathway that is burned in so it's not just the same old thing every time 
because you have like a whole day right. for novelty. That resonates for sure. Rather than the, the you know, going and meeting up in the same room at the same time or whatever. Yeah, that definitely mm-hmm. resonates. So I know that you and Marcus sought out a couples therapist at some point. Um, Mm -hmm. was this before or after you became an expert in AEDP, right? Your, your accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy. Is that before? Wow. He got it. I'm (laughs) impressed. (laughs) You you studied that. (laughs) So it was, um, it was in the early stages of beginning that training process. So I was already a licensed psychologist at that point, and I'd been doing couples therapy for a number of years. Um, But I started this really intensive, immersive training program with the ADP Institute. And so at the beginning of that process, I, there were a number of things that were going on in my relationship with Marcus, but um, I started feeling like I really need to have an experience with AADP. And for a long time, I had been in therapy for years. It was like a requirement of my graduate program and I'd also just been interested in therapy and wanted to experience it and wanted to keep growing. And so I'd had lots of experiences with therapy, but I hadn't had an experience where I felt like I was really changed by it. And so when I discovered ADP, I thought, okay, here is an opportunity. I actually believe that this changes people. I've, I've experienced that on the therapist end of it. Um, and so I, I just really wanted to have the experience. So when we came to a point where I knew that Marcus and I could really benefit from couples therapy, I found an ADP therapist and it has been everything I hoped it would be. Wow. Okay, are you willing to share one of those first experiences that you that yeah. you guys had? Sure. If I can remember, you mean like one of the first sessions? Yeah. Let's see. Um, it's been a while. It's been, I guess, over five years. I think. Um, you know, I honestly, I honestly don't remember what any particular aspect of the first session or any topic or anything. But I know the reason that we went there was because I was having these, um, I was just having a lot of anger at him for, um, I'm fine being specific about this, for his decision to do grid. And he was going to be going away for a few months. And I was fine with him going away, but I, I felt really upset and angry like when grid started they were talking about it being like this huge thing and that they they were going to turn it into a reality show and like there were going to be cameras in our home and all this stuff and i was just like i want no part of this this is not me i just was really really uncomfortable with that aspect of it obviously it didn't go that way but um and i found myself just feeling really angry with him and i had never felt that um in a situation where I expected and wanted myself to be excited for him and supportive of him. And I was having a really hard, I was fighting the feeling a lot. And so I was having a hard time sharing it with him. So I remember in those first sessions, um, just starting to share that with him really honestly. And our therapist, um, helped me not just share it with him. This is what ADP is about. Helped me not just share it with him, verbally or cognitively, um, but to share it with him emotionally and for him to actually be with me while I was feeling that towards him and feeling all the sadness and the fear and the other feelings that were kind of mixed up in it, um, to actually experience those emotions with him, with the support of our therapist and to have him have the support from her to actually be able to take it in and to hear it and to not hear it as criticism and, um, to just kind of be with me in that vulnerability was, was really substantially relationship changing. And that was just the beginning. It was like, yeah. just sort of break, breaking the surface. That's so cool. That's so cool. And it, can you, can you describe further that being with each other emotionally? Uh, I, I think I've heard you describe it as, you know, describing the physical sensations that go along with those feelings and, and things like that. So you're asking for me to explain what that yeah, means. Yeah, exactly. What does it mean? So, there's such a there's a difference between talking about a feeling mm-hmm. and actually feeling a feeling. And many of us are comfortable talking about 
a feeling, you know, the way that I just talked about that experience of sharing my anger and fear and sadness with Marcus. That's me talking about those feelings, but me actually feeling those feelings with you right here on this podcast would be a completely different podcast, first of all, and a completely yeah. <laughs> different experience for me. Yeah. Right. So I might be crying. I might be shaking. I might be having some somatic um, experience of that feeling that I wasn't having when I was talking about it. So for me to experience those feelings and for Marcus to be with me while I'm being with those feelings is what, that's what I mean. Yeah. Is that clear? That's awesome. Yeah. I had an experience recently at, uh, in a group called the Mankind Project. Have either of you heard of that? No. Mm -hmm. It's wor It's based on some of the similar work as David Dieta, who wrote uh, The Way of the Superior Man. And yeah. I did an exercise. I, I was holding on to a resentment against someone. And it, it, this one's kind of fresh, so I'm not going to go be very <laughs> specific. But I was resentful towards someone. And we did an exercise where a friend of mine who was there, he stood across from me, and I shared... I shared what I was feeling as I was feeling those, those feelings, right? And what happened was I, I, I talked about it first, and then one of the people in the group said, what would that actually sound like? Like, what would that anger actually sound like if you were in it? And I let out a primordial scream that you would not imagine, right? I screamed wow. so loud in my friend's face. And my friend is just there as a, He's just there to help me, right? I'm not angry at him, but he was yeah. speaking to him as if he's that person. And through that, I, I fully expressed the emotion. And then he asked me, now, is there a way that you might be projecting what you think he did to, to you? Might you be projecting some of that onto him? And I realized that I had treated this person in the exact same way years before. And just like that, I was able to have compassion for him and I completely worked through the conflict. And it wouldn't have happened if I wasn't able to express and be in that emotion as you were just talking about. Wow. So going back to the chorus, and this will make sense to you now that you've gone through it, you, it sounds like you followed that wave of emotion all the way to its natural endpoint, and it got you to this point of best self. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's so cool. I heard somewhere that no emotion can last longer than five to seven minutes if felt fully. Yeah, I've heard that too. I think physiologically that's true. I think it depends on the in intensity of the emotion. Um, but yeah, I think physiologically that's true. Hormonally, that's true. Yeah. I want to find that. I want to find some research on that because I've, I've always like heard it but never seen any, anything real on it. Yeah, if you find it, send it. Yeah, I will. I'd love to see that. Okay. Uh, last question before we get into your course a little bit. Is there any risk in entering therapy with a partner? Um, or is it just a perception that people who go to therapy are weak that holds people back from seeking help? I think there shouldn't be risk. I think with the right therapist, there really shouldn't be risk. There are some situations where there is risk and so if there's violence in the relationship um couple therapy is not recommended it's not it is risky and can be physically risky emotionally risky um i know a lot of people are scared that couples therapy will bring up issues that aren't um aren't really major problems or that it will kind of dredge up stuff from the past that that um one or both people feel like they're done with and I feel like there are there it, there are situations where couples therapy does do that I think when couples therapy is good it doesn't do that and there's there's this uh, saying in ADP that um, that if it's if it's not good it's not the end so and what that means is if um, if you're in sort of a difficult um, moment with somebody or uh, you're, you're feeling a, an emotion that feels uncomfortable, it's not the end of that wave. There's more to do. There's more to process. There's more to experience there. Um, and, and in some ways, I feel like that applies to good couples therapy is that if you're still in that sort of sticky point, 
there's something that's unfinished that needs to be finished, whether it gets finished in the session or whether it gets finished after the session, there's something more that needs to be processed. So I think good couples therapy is not risky. Um, and I and pretty much any ADP therapist who is who has an intention of doing ADP, even if they're not doing it perfectly, which doesn't even exist, it's not risky. Um, but you know, there's such a range out there of couples therapists and of approaches, and um, so yeah, there are therapists out there that that aren't good, and then there are a lot of really great ones. Is there any way? I I I know that it's really hard to discern this, but is there any do you have any suggestions for people like on how to tell if they have a good therapist or how to find a good therapist? It should help. It should make things better. And if it's not making things better, if it's making things worse, if you're coming away from any given session feeling like you didn't get something from it or that you're not in a better place individually or together, it's probably not the right person. You should feel something um not necessarily a good feeling like happy, but you should feel some sense of productivity and fulfillment or satisfaction or growth um, at the end of every session. And I tell my clients that, and if they're not feeling that, that's something we need to be talking about. I, I consistently ask clients, how, how is this going? Are we on the right track? Did, right. did, what did you get from this? To make sure that they are getting what I want them to be getting. Yeah, some issues are just way too big to overcome in, in a one hour session, but you should sure. feel like you're you're making strides forward, right? You're both learning exactly. about what you know what the other needs, you're feeling like you're expressing yourself and you're understood and you're moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I want to jump in here real quick um, to share, you know, I've had experience going through, um, you know, as a client going through ADP as an individual and not through couples therapy. And I can tell you that how uh, I decided that I wanted to keep going with this was the first 15 to 20 minute consultation that's free. Um, and I assume that, you know, there are a ton of therapists out there who may be offering something like that to give you a bit of a taste of, uh, you know, is this right for you? Is this right for me? Really getting that understanding from the beginning. And I remember that that first, uh, that first consultation, you know, we talk about in the course, uh, am I safe here? That box needs to be checked, right? Um, for a relationship to have that secure base from which you can grow. And I immediately remember just like, I felt so many sensations. I remember I started crying within like the first five minutes. It was like totally like unexpected of what I had in my head when I was uh, going into this consultation. I wasn't expecting any of that. And I immediately, I remember it was just 20 minutes, but in that next week, I felt such a sense of release and growth and like Meg was saying, productivity towards the things that I was working on that I was like super excited to get back to the next session. Um, and so I think it, there there is this um, subconscious thing inside all of us that when you have this one-to-one -one interaction with someone, if it's during that 15, 20 minute free consult, or you even decide to go with a one hour session just to test it out with a practitioner, I mean, you're going to um, feel that vibe of, oh, am I safe here? Can I bring my full self to this interaction? And if those two things can be checked, then you're on the right track and keep going with it. If not then you know there's a lot of people out there and, and i'm sure you can find somebody who's a, a good fit for you that's a good segue let's talk about the art and science of connection so you put together this this short course it's it's got a bunch of videos it's got a, an ebook and basically you're teaching people how to build trust with clients so that they feel safe enough to explore and grow right and, and to have a transformation in your gym and I love how the book starts out. This is one of the, I'm going to read one of the, the first little bits of the book. It says, but how do human beings change? Imagine a baby just learning to walk. A baby goes from doing almost nothing at all, but sleeping, eating, and pooping to rolling, crawling, cruising, and then walking. How is it that typical babies across the globe learn to walk? What drives them so hard, falling over hundreds of times, and yet they persist? 
Human beings are curious. We are born this way. Humans are hardwired from the start to explore. So how do humans grow and change? We explore. But the bigger question is, what makes an adult rediscover their drive to explore? The answer to this question are what turn good coaches into great ones. That's a bomb ass way to start a book right there. <laughs> that was great. That was good, good job, guys. So, how, how, how do they exactly, how does an adult rediscover that, that desire to explore? You want to go into this one? I, you know, I, I, I think this may be a good one for you to go into because when I think of curiosity in me, it's really something that I can't think of a time where like I didn't have that. I always wanted to like ask questions or learn more. I mean, that's how like the podcast began. And I was always that person who would like, uh, even if I didn't ask it out loud, like I was thinking this stuff inside my head. So that curiosity was something somewhat innate within me that I, I, I'm not sure if I, um, fully like lost it at some point and then had to make, uh, an effort to kind of get it back. So I don't know. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Meg. Well, going back to that, oh, two things. Okay. Cause so going back to what Ms. was saying about, um, checking that box, checking that box. Am I safe here? Is my full self allowed here? I think that is what we all need primarily to, to feel safe exploring. And going back to that um, example of the baby, you know, as, as you know, Marcus, and I have a baby, she's almost one. And um, I spent a lot of time sitting on the floor and just watching her and just seeing what she does. And um, babies, and this is true about all of them, not just her, when they feel safe, they explore. And when they know that their person, whether it's mom, dad, caretaker, whoever, whether they're, when they know that their person is there as a secure base, as like a check-in point, they can go off and explore the room, explore the house, whatever stage they're at. So, and that applies to adults as well. That applies to athletes working with a coach. If they know, okay, my coach is my secure base. I know that my coach is there for me. He or she is, is, is present to hear me, to understand me, to validate my feelings when I have them. Um, she wants to understand me, they will, they, they will go out and explore. And if that is exploring in their professional life, if that's exploring in the gym, it's, it's accessing that part of them. That's curious about how, how much can I expand in my life? So it goes beyond the gym. So how do, how, how do so many people become like complacent and just lose that curiosity? Cause I think every human being, I, I, I guess we know this at this point, uh, every human being is innately curious, but yet so many people are just stuck in their ways. They're complacent. They're not really pushing the boundaries. Uh, they're not. They're not risking themselves as they once did. Why is that? I, mean, I feel like the, our response for most of us, our responsibilities increase as we get older. So you know, I think about this a lot. Like the things that I would take risks the kinds of risks I would take before, like in my twenties and thirties are very different than the kinds of risks that I would take now. And I think, again, there's sort of this like adaptation that has to happen where, you know, in my twenties, I was like traveling to sub-Saharan Africa by myself and like doing all of this stuff that when I think about it now, I'm like, I, I don't think I would do that. Like I, I have a kid that I need to be around that I want to be around. I don't want to be gone for a month and I don't want to risk my life in the XYZ ways. And, um, there were just sort of physical risks I was taking that, um, I just wouldn't take now. But I think the, the adaptation that has to happen is, um, finding the new ways to take risks given the context of the new responsibilities that come with, with growing up and aging. So Ms. But I think you can talk about this from the sense of coaching, right? You, um, you see athletes come in that are closed off and you see them go through a change when they open up and they kind of start exploring physically, right? What can you, mm -hmm. can you talk about uh, maybe a specific athlete you've worked with, not, not by name, um, and, and kind of what that transformation has been like? Yeah. Um, you know, there's someone that's coming to mind 
right away who I've been working with only for a couple weeks now. And initially when she came in for her first consultation, um, she was very defensive, um, was testing me in a lot of ways. Like I felt like I was being challenged, you know, like she was trying to get a sense of, do I know what I'm doing? Which is totally normal. I, I, I kind of appreciated that, but it was also like, yeah, there was this, there was this barrier between us that I could sense very early on. And in that, um, initial consultation and we did some movement in that first session as well, but she had been through so many relationships one-on-one -on -one with trainers and coaches that didn't end up being super successful for her. And she, you know, she, I, I, I totally respected the fact that coming into this, like that was already present. And so my job really was just to kind of listen and to hear from her, like what she's looking to get out of this experience. What has she experienced in the past that, uh, did didn't work, what did work, really just trying to understand. And uh, soon enough, a couple days later, uh, she decided to take the leap. She's like, you know, I have a good feeling about this. Let's give it a go and see what happens. And so we started working together. We put her through like a three, you know, we have three 60 minute uh, assessments that we do movement related before we go on to ongoing coaching. And so during that time, I got to talk to her even more and, and get a feel for what she actually wants, what she doesn't want. And and she was very explicit with some of the things that she was open to changing and some of the things that she wasn't. So I remember like her diet was one thing. She was like, I'm going to do this on my own. I don't, I, I don't want like your input on this. Right. And it was totally like, I'm like, cool. All right. I'm just like, I'm, I'm here for what, you know, for you, like, this is your experience. I'm not going to push my, uh, food beliefs on you if you're not open to kind of taking that on. Same thing movement wise. She didn't want to touch a barbell. That was like something super like she was afraid of and, and things like that. Now I had the pleasure of watching her access her own transformance drive, which is something we talk about in the course continually every session that she came in i would say within that first week it was like she was a completely different person like she was making these realizations on her own through movement not me i wasn't you know i wasn't pushing any of this stuff on top of her it was like we were going through some basic you know movement stuff and i was you know putting her through it and on her own you could tell she was like okay, next set, don't, don't tell me anything. Like, I don't, I don't want you to help me. I want to try it on my own, you know? And that was a big step for her because throughout this whole time, she had made it explicit how she needed a ton of guidance and, and needed that, uh, handholding for quite, you know, quite a long time, like several weeks, several months before she was left on her own. And so I watched that change happen within her within that first week. Another thing was, uh, the barbell. So the barbell was something that, um, you know, we did a wide stance, seated good morning. And I was like, Hey, you know, don't forget, like we had this kind of playful, uh, interaction back and forth. I was like, I brought the barbell. I'm like, Hey, don't freak out. This is just an empty barbell. I want you to use it in this manner and really just, you know, perform the movement, uh, in this, this, and this way. Right. And so she did it. And then she's like, whoa, that like, that wasn't so bad. You know, like I, I did a movement with a barbell. The next thing, you know, she sees somebody back squatting in the corner and she was like, I want to be able to do that. Nice. I was like, whoa, I didn't do any of this. You know, I didn't, I didn't, um, force any of this on top of her. I just watched it happen by kind of creating space in that relationship between us for her to like you know, really express what she wants out of this and make her own, uh, conclusions and realizations about like what she's really after. So that was the coolest experience for me because, you know, throughout the course building and stuff like that, we're really talking about transformance drive. And, uh, that's kind of the art to good coaching, right? Helping your clients access their own drive, not chasing them down and kind of forcing the stuff on top of them to make them accountable. It's like that needs to that intrinsic motivation needs to come from within the client. And I watched it kind of happen, you know, within a period of like a week, week and a half. Um, and I'm still kind of watching it happen. So it's, it was a very cool, uh, situation to kind of encounter. Yeah. It's so, it's so simple and subtle. You're, you're basically just making this person feel safe, right? You're making them feel like mm -hmm. you understand what they want. You respect what they want and you're an expert and you've got their back. And now they can slowly start to move away from home base, right? Mm -hmm. so, That's exactly it. So in the book, 
you write about all all feelings being sacred, which I absolutely love. I think this is a really huge concept. So many of us try to push away certain emotions, um, but it's as you, as y'all describe, it's like trying to turn off an emergency engine on a car. Right? We can try to push it away, but the problem is is still there somewhere. Uh, for me. Jealousy and envy is like that emotion that I just think I don't I, I've, I've programmed myself for so long to think it's never okay to feel those and so when I start to feel them I really feel myself pushing away and like trying to block those emotions right and in in the early part of our relationship I would I would feel envy toward or jealousy towards a D you know if she would like have too long of a conversation with a guy or if a guy looked at it the wrong way. And what, what I learned is that feeling jealousy is actually okay and it shows me that there's something wrong here, right? And it's, it's one thing if I were to say, Adi, you can never talk to any other guys ever, right? But it's another thing to express, hey, I'm feeling jealous. I would appreciate if you um, kept me in mind when when we're in like these social interactions, right? And being able to be vulnerable and voice having that feeling allowed her to really show up for me and, and make me feel safe, especially when we're really early on in a relationship. So you guys talk about the fact that all feelings serve a purpose, they have a function, and they are mechaniz mechanisms that are designed to help us survive. What is it, how does this relate to connecting with others, including our clients? Mm -hmm. So, so if we take that example, is it okay if we take that example? Yep. Okay. So you were aware of the feeling of jealousy, right? Do you have a sense of which, which emotion bucket that went into for you? Fear. Okay. So you know that it's in the fear bucket, you're on the fear spectrum. The way that that can um, lead to deeper connection, that that can actually be an opportunity for you individually and for you and Adi as a couple is by labeling for yourself, okay, I'm on the fear spectrum or I'm in the fear bucket, however you wanna say it. Um, and to share that with her and very much the, the way that you did, but kind of with the core emotion in mind as fear, um, and even to ask her to, let's say, let's say you ask her to kind of just be with you with that. So like something like, Adi, God, I'm really feeling scared. Every time you you talk to somebody else, I just noticed I had this wave of fear that comes up. Can we talk about it? Can I share it with you? To kind of invite her into your process, which is, which is probably pretty vulnerable in that moment. Um, but my guess is she would respond with like, yeah, of course, I would love to be with you in that. Like she was probably going to feel like really invited into your world in a, in a sweet connecting kind of way. And then maybe you just share whatever's going on. Like, yeah, like, you know, my stomach is all tied up in knots and like I have this knot in my throat and like I've been obsessing on this all day. I can't stop thinking about it. And she's because you've already kind of put your card in vulnerability wise, she's going to be right there with you, like probably just naturally saying something reassuring or snuggling you, you know, whatever, whatever her style is for responding to you. But right there, like that feeling of jealousy or fear is turned into this moment of connection, this opportunity for connection and deepening your knowing and being with each other. And that's almost exactly how, how it happened. She responded is it? like so supportively and just maybe, like I said, made me feel so safe and understood. Uh, I didn't have quite quite the language, but now I do. Sure. I feel I feel upgraded. <laughs> you know, that's so awesome that that one that you shared that example and that we can use it in this context. And it makes me think of what you were saying before about like what are the obstacles to um, actually making the implicit explicit and sharing the emotions we have when we have them. Because I think the language is often missing. Most of us don't ever learn how to one know what we're feeling and two how to share what we're feeling or how to talk about what we're feeling. So that's one of the things that this course I think does is it it provides the language and actually teaches the skill of knowing what language to use when and how to word things, which is something we never, we never learn. Right. So one thing you started to hint at, which I want to 
I want to make explicit for everyone is this uh, <laughs> the concept of core emotions. And so I said I was feeling jealousy and envy, and you said basically like what core emotion bucket is that does that fall in? What what yeah. is a core emotion? What are what's the importance of identifying our core emotions when we're feeling? Yeah. So a core emotion is um, human beings are hardwired, which means we are born with this capacity to have six core emotions and every other feeling fits into um, one of these six core emotions. So a core emotion can be made up of lots and lots of different feelings. So I think of them as buckets or as um, a spectrum. So for example, uh, the anger bucket is made up of lots of different kinds of anger. So on one end might be, or like a really full bucket might be something like rage and a, ver a, a bucket that's maybe a quarter full would be something like irritation or agitation. Um, so the, the, the key to accessing our transformance drive, as Ms. was talking about earlier, is feeling our emotions and following them through that natural endpoint, which is that wave that we were talking about earlier with your example of right. yelling at your friend. So what are all six? I know you have happiness, sadness, anger. Keep going. So I, it helps. The rhyming helps. So mad, sad, glad. Mad, I always start with mad, mad sad, sad glad, fear, surprise, disgust. So there's five bad ones and only one good one. I guess surprise well, can be good. <laughs> that's inter can be good. It's interesting that you, that you think of it that way. I mean, I think... Well, bad ones, yeah, it is interesting. <laughs> Isn't that? <laughs> yeah. Should we talk about that? It's just alarms. <laughs> okay, all right, I see you. Where does love fall in? Which one does love go in? Happiness? That's interesting. I, I think love can go in different ones. I think love can go in happiness, um, but it doesn't always. I think it can also go in fear. It can go in sadness. Um, what, do, what do you two think about it? I think it depends on the situation, the person, how you're experiencing love in that moment. I don't think it's one one feeling. And and that's a, that's a key point to note with any uh, feeling that you try to categorize in one of these buckets is that it's never 100% absolute. It may be like, okay, we're in 70% in the fear bucket right now, and we're 30% in uh, surprise. You know, it, it doesn't have to be 100% in one bucket or the other, especially when we think of love, which is such a, a big topic, and there's so many feelings and emotions associated with that concept. It, it's hard to pinpoint it in one bucket or the other. Right. It's also one of those, I'm reluctant to even call it a feeling. In some ways, I think of it more as an experience. Um, it's one that has very different meanings, culture to culture. And um, there isn't, so one of the ways that can be helpful to think about this, um, the six core emotions all have a corresponding face or um, facial expression that goes with them. And those are also universal. So if you ask in someone's native language, can you make the face for surprise or can you make the face for a disgust? It's the face is consistent across all human beings everywhere. Whereas love is, is there's a lot of variety there, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I don't, I don't, yeah, there's not one face I make. Right. Can you make your love face? No, I don't. I would be embarrassed to make my love. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay, I, I want to finish up with what you guys call the em empathic statement, right? Creating, creating connection kind of out of nowhere, and it's a very tac tactile thing that you can use with clients, with anyone in a relationship, to make them feel. Um, to, to build trust and to make them feel safe with you. I think this is just such a, just such a great way to interact with anyone, in, anyone in our lives, really. So can y'all just go through the three parts? The first one is, is start with a core emotion. What, what is it? How do we use it? Yeah, so this first part is uh, labeling your emotion. And that comes back to... Let's say that you are feeling that jealousy, you're feeling, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things, a lot of thoughts and feelings that come associated with 
when you think about yourself uh, in a position where you're feeling a little bit of jealousy or envy, it's easier for your system to process I'm feeling scared right now, or I'm feeling jealous versus uh, thinking the 20 thoughts that come associated with all of that and sends your mind kind of spiraling in all these different directions. For you to label that um, is a little bit easier for your system to process. And when we think about this in client interactions or with anybody on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, we've talked about how it is a bit of a risk to go into uh, labeling an emotion. So, so, um, you know, if I'm talking to you and I sense a little bit of fear and I say, you seem, you seem scared. And I, I take a little bit of pause there and I wait for you to either affirm that and say, yeah, you know, I am feeling scared. And now you feel heard, feel understood, and you will elaborate and give me some more detail. Or even if I'm wrong, um, th there's nothing uh, good or bad associated with that because you're going to correct me. Actually, you know, it's not fear that I'm feeling, it's blank, right? And then that opens up dialogue into a whole nother realm that we can use to kind of keep the conversation moving forward. Um, part two, do you want to dig into that? Yeah. So part two is, um, am I blanking on part, uh, the joining statement? Yeah. So the joining statement, um, so we've just said something like, oh, you, you seem scared, some kind of core emotion. And then there's a pause. So you wait for the, the client or the person to respond um, to either affirm that or to give you more information about what is actually accurate for them. And then um, so the joining phrase is a way to what this they call an ADP, undoing aloneness. So it's a way of communicating to the person that you're talking to that you're with them. So it could sound something like, um, wow, I really want to hear more about this. Or um, can we look at this together? Or um, some something like that, something that, that shows that you uh, want to face this with them, that they're not alone. And again, this goes back to primal drives and us knowing that this person is there for us and they're with us. Love it. And this next part was a little bit of an aha moment for me. It, it, it makes perfect sense and it's but it's not something that I, I'm doing regularly. And it's, it's such a, yeah, it's such a great little addition. That's yeah, the last part, <clears throat> self-disclosure, that, that seems to be um, one of my favorite ones. And I remember Meg pointing out to me that I, when we were building this course, that I do this naturally all the time, but just haven't recognized it. And so that might be a good exercise for people to meta process this stuff is notice the conversations you're having day to day and notice when you are practicing some of these elements and also spot opportunities for when you can plug some of these in. And, and it doesn't even have to be you're trying it out right away. Just be aware of kind of uh, these interactions day to day. So self-disclosure is really when we uh, express, you know, like I'm feeling very excited to work with you on this. You know, you are, yeah, there's a little bit of a joining statement there as well, but you're also sharing how you're feeling about this entire process. You know, there are moments where I have a client in front of me and I'm feeling, um, I may be feeling a little bit nervous, right? Or a little unsure of something and finding a way to disclose that and bring that out to the forefront might be helpful. On the other end, it, it's also helpful for when we have, you know, it, when you're working with a client that really lights you up, right? Don't assume that the client can pick up on that. You you want to be able to share that with them um, because, you know, we want it coming back to we want to make the implicit explicit, right? I'm feeling ecstatic to be able to work with you on this journey or whatever the language might be that comes naturally to you. Sharing how you're feeling and really kind of saying it out loud versus letting it sit in your head um, for sure has some value to it. Yeah, it's such a gift, right? That self-disclosure is such a gift to that other person. It's like a little, it's a form of vulnerability, right? Um, you're, you're, you're now like sharing in that moment with each other and, and saying, hey, we're going to embark on this thing together. I love that. It's also, it's also a way of um, tapping into, as a coach, it's, it's a way of tapping into your own transformance drive in sharing some of that with the client. It helps them tap into theirs. That's cool. And, and one of, the, one of the, the big parts for me, the reason that this made this so impactful was that you draw the distinction between what's usually done and a self-disclosure. And what's usually done is something like, 
here's how, so let's say someone wants to lose weight. They're really afraid that this isn't going to work for them because they've tried everything in the book, right? And so your approach is, man, it sounds like you're, you're really scared. You're, you're afraid that you're going to put in all of this work again and it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. I totally get that. And so going along with your, your system, um, I totally understand that. And I would love to be a part of, of helping you reach your goals. Um, as you're sitting there, you know, being authentic with me and being honest with me, I'm like, I'm getting really excited because I think it is X, Y, Z, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would usually do is I would say, you know, after my back surgery, I put on some weight and I was really afraid and I did this and it worked really well for me. Aren't you, aren't you like inspired? Like you can do it too. And that's Mm -hmm. so normal. Like here's what I did and that's what we're going to do with you. But it doesn't, it really doesn't tap into that person's emotions and it doesn't, Mm -hmm. it doesn't tap into what you guys are calling the the transformative, the transformative, how how do you say it? Transform, transformance. Transformance drive. Yeah. Yeah, That's, that sounds like a movie. (laughs) It doesn't tap into their intrinsic motivation because it's, it's, um, yeah, it doesn't tap into their emotions. So I really, really love that tactical approach. All right. The other thing about that is that it can, um, there are certain clients that that can work for, but the majority it doesn't work for because it taps into their shame and it taps into their, you know, right. Uh, self-critical sort of self-doubting like, well, why couldn't I do that? He did it. Why couldn't I do it? He doesn't get me like those kinds of spiraling thoughts that don't go, don't go towards transformers drive. Right. Yeah. They might've already tried the approach that I just brought up and it makes them feel embarrassed. Like they already tried it and failed. And now this definitely ain't going to work either. Right. Right. What else should people know about building? And this is, this is the last question before I have a couple rapid fires and I'll let y'all get out of here. Thanks for letting me kind of go all over the place today, guys. Yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> what else should people know about building a solid relationship with their clients? One or one or two big takeaways. The very first one that comes to mind for me is to start with understanding yourself. Start with understanding your own emotions, your own feelings, your own experiences. And I mean, for something that's very concrete, practice learning how to label your own emotions. And that's going to help you connect with your clients better than anything else that I can think of. And what comes up for me is, and this was kind of unexpected, but... uh, judgment like trying to um be cognizant of what are your biases as a coach you know whether it's you know training related whether it's the food protocols you enjoy things that have worked for you and not reflecting that onto your clients meeting them where they're at you know and really kind of clearing a space that like hey this is a judgment free zone we are not going to i'm not judging you know if you did your food logs or not i'm ju- not judging if you like to down a 2 liter bottle of soda every day like this is where you're at right now and and you know even though i may not be in that place like i'm not reflecting that onto the client i'm creating this space where uh, they feel very comfortable to kind of uh, explore and that's something that i really try to um, you know go out of my way to help people feel comfortable and whether it's a client interaction or just day-to-day conversations is really kind of uh, trying to create a space where I feel like they feel comfortable sharing things with me they feel safe and that box uh, is checked that's huge man I love that best relationship book that you would recommend go each one of you attached Amir Levine uh, conscious loving. Oh, that shit. was, that yeah, was that was, nice. that was, that was actually, I remember it was you and Adi both when you came on the show, you recommended that and I read it and whether you're in a relationship or not, uh, just for you connecting with yourself, it can, it can do a lot. Nice. Uh, what is a belief that you hold if that, if others held it would have the biggest effect on their life and performance in general? You are the hero of your own movie. That's a Joe Rogan thing right there where he says, you know, what would the hero 
in your movie do and go out and do that. Um, and if we all kind of looked at our life in that way, I think we'd be willing to take some more risks. We'd be willing to be a little more playful and step out of our comfort zone. Take ownership over your own personal growth. That's power right there. When we take ownership <laughs> over our stuff, then we have power. When other people are to blame, we are powerless. Great advice. Okay. Cool. Guys, uh, obviously, I love this one. This is the longest show I think I've ever recorded. So <laughs> thank, y all, thank you. Thank you for uh, all of your time and, and being open and authentic with us. This was phenomenal. Where can people find out more about the course and about each of you personally? So for the course, people can visit theairbornemind.com. Uh, if you want to go straight to the page, it's forward slash AOC. And on that page, you can check out the details of the course. You can even uh, try one of the video segments for free. Um, and to get at me personally, um, I'm most active on Instagram at Airborne Mind is the handle. And uh, if you love podcasts, check out the Airborne Mind show, which is on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you like to listen. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Megan Caden, and you can also find me at my website, megancaden.com. And when is your podcast coming out, guys? Ooh, oh, so we've already, <laughs> yeah, so we've already started um, recording and we're pretty excited. It's a very free space for us to discuss more, uh, have more dialogue around some of the things you heard about today, relationships, connection, communication, conversations. Um, and so we're, we don't have a hard release date on that yet, but we would love to see it in the next uh, month or two roll out. Awesome. Pay attention to their Instagrams. I'm sure they'll announce that all over the place. Guys, thank you so much again, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Thank Mike. you. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.